Okay, welcome everyone. Um, uh, welcome to today's online causal inference seminar. Um, so today uh, our speaker will be Daniel Malinsky from Columbia University. Um, and he will talk us about uh, his work on explaining the behavior of black box prediction algorithms with causal learning. Uh, our discussant today will be Joshua Loftus from the London School of Economics. Um, so uh, Daniel's collaborator, uh, Nimo, will be uh, monitoring the chat box uh, for uh, questions. Um, and I think about two thirds of um, Daniel's slides he said it's slide 16, he will uh, make a pause uh, and he will also um, answer questions. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me give the stage to Daniel. Oh, can I just say a few things about the question oh, yeah. and answer? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, Emma. Sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, so just a few things about questions. Please use the Q&A to ask questions, not the chat. This way, the questions can be answered publicly. So as Qingyuan mentioned, uh, Numer is going to be monitoring the Q&A part and answering questions there. A few questions will be flagged for Dan to answer live. And for those questions, either I will ask Dan or uh, I will ask one of you to raise your hand and ask the question live. Just keep in mind that the session is being recorded so that if you ask your question live, you may be heard on the recording later on. All right, uh, that's it. So now I'll take it over to Dan. Cool, great. So sharing my slides, everybody can see my slides okay and hear me, great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here at this uh, great seminar series. Thanks to the organizers, both for inviting me and for, in general, organizing this great series, which I've really enjoyed. Um, and thank you to the, uh, to the guests for coming to watch us talk. Um, so my talk today will be on the subject of uh, explainable AI or explainable machine learning from a kind of causality or causal inference point of view. And it's based on joint work with my collaborators, Numer Sani and Ilya Spitzer, who are both at Hopkins. Um, there's an archive paper online, a draft paper that um, you'll see the reference at the end of the slides. Um, so the starting point, the starting observation of this kind of project is that many of the most successful machine learning algorithms are so-called black boxes. It is not transparent to the user on what basis they arrive at their predictions. Usually it's some complex combination of feature extraction and a neural network or multiple neural networks or multiple feature extractors, which uh, are used uh, as the basis of an algorithmic procedure to make predictions about say, what's, what's located in an image or what is the meaning of a text um, in most of my examples in this talk, I'm going to talk in terms of images um, and assume that the, and, and use kind of a running example of image classification with a, uh, say, a convolutional neural network as the, the black box. Um, but everything I'll say also applies more broadly to other kinds of data, for example, video or text, like natural language processing uh, data or um, audio data, uh, and it doesn't have to be a convolutional neural network. It could be sort of like any machine learning black box uh, procedure. But to fix ideas, I'll focus kind of on the example of image, uh, image analysis with neural networks. And there has been an interest in understanding how to explain or interpret the behavior of these black box prediction models. Uh, and why, why should we care about this? Well, there's, there's several different reasons. First, this kind of general interest in transparency uh, and communication and trust in procedures that are very complex. If you're going to deploy these procedures in settings, for example, like in healthcare or in criminal justice, uh, there is a, a strong 
intuition that we should understand what's going on with these methods before we use them in order to, to put our trust in, in, uh, in their ability to help make very complex and consequential decisions. There's also an interest in recourse, which is a, a term uh, used in some literature for understanding how um, individual users that are affected by algorithms can um, question or challenge the algorithm's predictions about something if that, if that prediction is thought to be uh, inadequate or unfair in some way. Um, there's also a question of algorithm auditing for reliability. So understanding what is going on with the algorithm can help understand whether irrelevant artifacts uh, are making a difference to the algorithm's behavior. For example, there's sort of like classic stories you can tell about um, was this image taken in the daytime or in the nighttime, or was it taken at hospital A versus hospital B, sort of irrelevant artifacts that are supposed to be, um, that we would like to guard against because they may lead to poor generalization of our prediction models in new settings. Um, and then finally, there's the kind of fairness or uh, bias perspective that understanding what base, on what basis the algorithm is making its predictions can help us understand if there are social biases related to say race or gender or something else that uh, are being perhaps unintentionally encoded into the algorithmic procedures themselves. So uh, my, the work we do here sort of focuses on these latter two um, motivations, the auditing for reliability and auditing for uh, fairness or bias concerns. And so I'll give two kind of quick examples. On the left, we have uh, some images from a paper uh, by Winkler et al. in JAMA Dermatology, where they study how uh, a convolutional neural network-based procedure, um, which is trained to recognize images of skin lesions in a healthcare setting, uh, can be affected by this irrelevant artifact, which is the purple marker highlighting made by radiologists or doctors, I think, uh, in the course of, of image analysis, which they do for their own reasons to, to help with identifying or uh, and delineating you know, lesions of interest, but which if they make their way into the training data on which the algorithm is trained, uh, it turns out may have a strong effect on the algorithm's behavior and performance, uh, which is undesirable. Um, on the right-hand side, an example from a nonprofit group called Algorithm Watch, which is a group that um, studies and writes about the use of algorithms in kind of socially impactful settings. And they wrote this, uh, this piece about the Google Vision API uh, is a sort of publicly available piece of software that Google has used for image classification and makes available to, to the public. And somebody noticed, I think on Twitter, that this uh, image, uh, this software seems to encode stereotyped associations. So they found this picture of a human hand holding uh, an electronic thermometer, a thermometer that we're probably all familiar with at this point, um, but was labeled as uh, highly likely to be a gun. And the question is whether that incorrect label was tracking stereotyped associations in the training data because the, hand, the skin color on the hand is black or dark. Uh, there was even a kind of uh, crude experiment that, the, that was discussed in this piece where somebody altered the image artificially to lighten the skin tone and the probability of gun decreased and the probability of some other category, monocular, increased. And so that was the, the hypothesis was that the Google Vision API was tracking stereotyped associations, whatever it was doing. Um, so in, in this talk, we're going to do the following. And it, I should say it's a bit of an unusual talk. We're not proposing a new algorithm or a new estimator or proving any sort of theoretical results about the behavior of a new estimator or a new algorithm. But rather, we're doing two things. We're making a kind of philosophical proposal about how we think that causality is relevant to explaining algorithm behaviors. And then a kind of algorithmic proposal where we we, we suggest applying existing causal discovery algorithms in a kind of new way to try and learn causal relationships between 
uh, interpretable features, I'll go into what that means, and the outputs of these black box decision uh, prediction algorithms. Uh, I'll illustrate the idea with a simulation experiment and then talk about two applications to real data, both in the domain of image classification, one where we're classifying birds into different kinds of species, and one where we're classifying lung x-rays uh, uh, as to whether they have pneumonia, exhibit pneumonia or not. Okay, so what's an explanation? So there are many, there's a large literature now in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence that, uh, that tries to tackle this problem of explanatory AI. And many approaches focus on one of two things, one approximating complex algorithms by simple model classes. For example, taking a complex neural network or a random forest or something else and using uh, sparse linear models to give you a good, as a good uh, or as good as possible approximation to the complex model class. And this is kind of under the presupposition that, uh, that sparse linear models are, are naturally interpretable because we know how much each term in the linear model uh, contributes to the prediction outcome. It's basically the regression coefficient. Um, and then there's feature importance methods which identify features or covariates. I'm using features in the kind of machine learning way, but they're just covariates highly associated with a particular algorithm output um, where that measure of association or measure of importance is based on uh, say large regression coefficients in the context of one of these approximating simple model classes or a large perturbation gradient, um, something which uh, is highly associated with the particular predicted class. Um, and the example, I, the image on the bottom half of the slide is from a famous paper that introduces the uh, Lime algorithm for explainability where the basic idea is for an input image, they're learning what are the sort of important super pixels uh, in, the, in the image for, for explaining why the classifier predicted a particular class. So the, the most likely classes for this image, according to the, some classifier they discussed was electric guitar, acoustic guitar, and Labrador. And if you ask what made, in some sense, what are the features most highly associated with the with a high probability of electric guitar. And it seems to highlight features that surround the fretboard of the guitar. Uh, for acoustic guitar, it seems to be something like the body and the bridge. And for Labrador, it seems to be something around the head. Um, and so that's a very uh, compelling and intuitive approach to algorithmic explanation. Um, but one thing that I think has been missing in this discussion is any sort of more systematic and philosophically grounded discussion of what it means to explain a phenomenon. And there's a long history of, of theorizing and writing about uh, explanation in the literature and philosophy and the philosophy of science, which goes back many decades really, but just focusing in on the 20th century, um, the role of causality in scientific explanation has become particularly central. So um, what, were, what are philosophers of science doing when they talk about explanation? Well, they say, you know, they're interested in understanding the sort of logic or the rules behind underlying uh, scientific explanation where theories, for example, theories in physics like general relativity or Newtonian mechanics or statistical mechanics, how those kinds of theories relate to the phenomena which they purport to explain. For example, the motion of the planets or the motion of uh, molecules in a gas. And in the mid 20th century, uh, the sort of standard model of explanation that was um, commonly discussed in the philosophical literature, uh, most associated with the philosopher Karl Hempel, uh, was a kind of deductive model, which says that an explanation is a kind of argument. It's an argument which identifies premises and general laws from which the target phenomenon, the thing that we're trying to explain, follows logically. So very roughly, what explains that the volume of this gas is y, say some value, you know, uh, two meters cubed. Um, well, the, if we write down the ideal gas law and some observations about initial conditions like temperature, and so forth, 
then you can just derive what the, what the volume is expected to be under those conditions using the ideal gas law and using basic logic. And that's what an explanation involves according to this kind of standard model schema. And there were uh, various debates about the schema. Things uh, became a bit more complicated. People introduced a kind of more statistical version where instead of using deductive logic to make the uh, phenomenon guaranteed, instead you might think of a kind of statistical version which makes the phenomenon only highly probable. So it says that with a high probability, the volume of the gas will be this. Um, but this came under fire from a variety of different directions in the philosophical literature. For example, it doesn't seem to capture this intuition that explanation seems to be asymmetric in practice. So uh, using the ideal gas law example, the ideal gas law and initial conditions might explain why the volume of a gas is at a particular value, but the reverse isn't true. If I said the volume of the gas is two meters cubed, it does not explain the ideal gas law. And you can think of less, uh, less sciencey versions of this where, um, for example, you have a, a swinging pendulum on a clock and it's well known that the length of the pendulum explains the period of motion of the swinging pendulum, but the reverse isn't true. So if I change the length of the pendulum, then the period of motion will change. But if I speed up the period of motion, it's not gonna change the length of the pendulum. This kind of asymmetric nature to explanation was a kind of a puzzle in this literature. And also that the kind of deductive view uh, and as well as the statistical view can't really distinguish between so-called relevant and irrelevant generalizations. Um, for example, uh, this idea that some phenomena you can sort of insert in the course of a logical argument but doesn't really seem actually relevant in some sense to the, the phenomena being explained. So I can add some additional irrelevant premises to my initial conditions about temperature and so forth. Um, and those won't make a difference for deriving the volume of the gas because all I really, this temperature is sort of sufficient along with the ideal gas law to tell me about the, the volume, uh, well, temperature and pressure, I guess. Um, so the response in the philosophical literature was to move towards considering counterfactuals and causality and their role in explanation. So uh, there's a kind of influential view that's best summarized by uh, James Woodward's book from 2003 that uh, presents a kind of counterfactual approach to causal explanation of phenomena in science, which roughly says that uh, X X helps explain some phenomenon Y if under suitable background conditions, some intervention on X produces a change in the distribution of Y. And this is a kind of counterfactual, causally grounded uh, approach to explanation of phenomena in very disparate general domains, including physics and biology and social sciences. Um, the kind of slogan is that, that explanations answer what what would have been different questions? To know how to explain why, I have to tell you what would have been different, namely some element of X, uh, to make a difference in the distribution of Y. And this approach to causal explanation addresses many of the issues with non-causal attempts at explanation. In particular, it, it does exhibit asymmetry in the kind of right kind of way, uh, as Woodward would argue. Uh, it also does, sort of seem to explain why some features are irrelevant uh, and some are not based on this kind of counterfactual dependence notion. So that if, if I add you, if I add a premise, which is not counterfactually relevant to the conclusion, it doesn't figure in the explanation or it's not necessary for the explanation at least. Um, and moreover, this approach to explanation has clear connections to causal modeling in uh, statistics and computer science as we do it here. And I should note, uh, the footnote says that in this discussion, and is often the case in, um, in this philosophical literature, we're going to focus on what's, what are called type level, not token level explanations. So we're explaining the distribution of some random variable y, that's the phenomenon, rather than in a particular event that the var variable y takes on a value, little y. So the kind of um, the standard example it is that we want to explain 
uh, that cancer causes smoking at the type level, not that my cancer causes my smoking, uh, which is like kind of event level or token level phenomenon. So what's our setup um, in this kind of machine learning uh, explainable AI setting? We assume that uh, we have some collection of low level input features X. So X is a vector uh, of low level features, for example, image pixels, if you're doing image analysis, or maybe um, words, if you're doing textual analysis. And this is supposed to be probably high dimensional. Um, we have an outcome Y taking values in some predefined space, script Y. And we have an algorithm, whatever that might be, which learns a map F uh, from the state space of X, this complicated high dimensional space, to the output space Y. So F is a function, which might be you know, a neural network parameterized by a billion parameters, or it might be something simpler like a random forest or, or linear regression or whatever it might be, um, which predicts the value Y and we'll say the predicted value is called Y hat. That's the sort of standard machine learning paradigm, right? Um, high level features is something we introduce as the sort of locus of explanation. So we're, we're not interested in uh, the causal relation, the causal determination of these low level individual input pixels, but we're interested in how something which is more at a uh, human understandable and potentially manipulable level of abstraction. So for example, and, and we'll, we'll denote those kinds of features by Z. As an example, uh, in these, this bird classification experiment I'll talk about later, if you have an image of a bird, um, X consists of the raw pixels, you know, 256 by 256 raw pixels or something like that. And the high level features correspond to sort of interpretable ornithological features that uh, we might hope our, our prediction algorithm is under the hood paying attention to, for example, the wing pattern, the color of the belly, the size of the beak uh, or the shape of the beak or the shape of the head or so forth. So those are um, kind of not directly used in the black box prediction algorithm. So F learns on the pixels X, but we hope that it's tracking uh, if it's a good algorithm, it's tracking something that's relevant about the you know, um, anatomy of birds and what distinguishes one bird from another, like things like these interpretable features, bill length, bill shape, and so forth. Um, and, or for example, in the, the X-ray data set that I'll talk about later, the raw pixel, the raw features X, the low level features consist in uh, the pixels of the X-ray. Um, and the high level features correspond to radio, um, radiologist labels about what's exhibited in the X-ray. For example, whether there's effusion or pneumothorax exhibited in the X-ray, which are particular uh, lung ailments or conditions that might be visible on a chest X-ray. Um, and our interest here then is to understand which of these high level features, if any, are causally relevant to the output of the prediction algorithm, Y hat. So um, that's the question, which elements of Z, if any, are causes of Y hat? And we propose to answer this question by learning a graphical representation over this set of variables, Z, Z1 through uh, Z uh, P, and Y hat allowing for arbitrary unmeasured confounders between uh, among these variables. And the reason for that, and this, this is quite important, is that it's entirely possible that some element of Z, some element of Z, say ZI, will be associated with the output of the algorithm Y hat due to something that's latent, a latent common cause or a latent confounder between ZI and Y hat. Namely that um, it might be that certain features say um, the, wing shape of the bird are not really causally efficacious in, in the in internal representation of the black box prediction algorithm, but that, they, that they're simply associated with something else that is the causally relevant variable. 
And uh, moreover, we know that in practice, we'll never have uh, a completely rich set of high level features. So in the data that we actually have on and say in this bird classification experiment, we have a bunch of uh, high level features that come along with the data. Uh, I think there was 20, 29 of them or so. Um, but not everything that may be relevant is in fact labeled as a high level feature. And so there might be some relevant but uh, unrecorded variables that are, are acting as confounders here. So, so the approach then is going to rely on learning, um, learning a graphical representation. Uh, I'm gonna assume that the audience here is at least familiar with the basic idea behind directed acyclic graphs or DAGs as causal representations among some multivariate system. Um, but because we are worried about the possibility of unmeasured confounders or latent variables, we're going to have to use a somewhat more complicated representational sch scheme called a PAG or a partial ancestral graph. And very roughly the way this works is that if you um, start with some sort of ground truth directed acyclic graph, like the one at the top of the slide, um, but you, you stipulate that some of the variables are unobserved, for example, u1 and u2 are unobserved uh, in the data or they're latent, then we can define the latent project, a latent projection uh, mixed graph, mixed because it has both directed and bidirected edges that captures all the conditional independence relationships among the observed uh, variables in the DAG and these, where these double headed arrows correspond to uh, what they mean is that Z2 is not a cause of Z3 and Z3 is not a cause of Z2, but rather there is some unmeasured common cause which explains their association in this case U1 in the ground truth. So, um, the kind of domain that we're interested in is not the domain, not the class of all directed acyclic graphs, but the class of these latent projection models with bidirected edges. And then we have to make a, a, a second kind of uh, conceptual step to equivalence classes of these, of these objects. So it's sort of well known in the space of DAGs that DAGs are not uniquely identifiable from conditional independence information alone. Um, usually you can only learn what's called uh, an equivalence class of DAGs, a CP DAG, a completed partial DAG. Um, and the same is true in the world of, of these latent projection graphs. Uh, I should say they're called MAGs because it stands for Maximal Ancestral Graph. I'm not gonna go through the definitions very formally, but I have some appendix slides at the end of these slides with, which have the definitions. An equivalence class of Maximal Ancestral Graphs is called a Partial Ancestral Graph or a PAG which has potentially these bidirected edges, as well as circle marks to indicate uh, uncertainty or ambiguity about some of the directionality. So when you see a circle, what that denotes is that, um, that there's uncertainty about whether there is a, another arrowhead at the place of that circle or a tail. Uh, so whether this is a directed edge from Z4 to Z3 or a bidirected edge. Uh, that indicates latent confounding. So some, some edges might be uniquely identified as directed or bidirected, and some will only be partially identified uh, and have these circles in them. So um, we're going to propose to learn a PAG representation from among uh, over these variables Z and Y hat, as I said earlier. The PAG will contain a variety of possible edges, including directed edges to indicate a causal relationship, bidirected edges to indicate a non-causal confounded relationship, and then partially directed edges and circles to indicate uncertainty about exactly what's going on. So if X circle Y, it may be directed or it may be bidirected. And if X circle circle Y, then it could kind of go in either direction or be bidirected. Uh, Hi, Dan. Yes. Just a reminder, there's a, about a bit less than 15 minutes left. So okay, I'll right. speed up. So I don't have time to go into how the FCI procedure uh, works here. Um, I do have some appendix slides at the end, but if you're very roughly familiar with the PC algorithm, the FCI, which stands for Fast Causal Inference, was a procedure uh, proposed by uh, Peter Spurdies and his collaborators back in the 90s, and then kind of um, 
developed in the years following, which is a constraint-based procedure that involves a sequence of conditional independence tests, orientations of arrows based on the so-called collider rule, and uh, additional orientations basically follow from the acyclicity assumption of the underlying DAG. So our approach then is ultimately assuming that y hat is some complicated function of, of x, but we're approximating that complicated function by a kind of structural causal model in terms of these high level features, uh, z tilde, uh, instead of x. We know that this is the truth, but this is sort of what we're approximating the truth with and that the Zs themselves are complicated functions of the underlying pixels or underlying low level features. And finally, that we only observe uh, a subset Z of the full level of uh, the full range of, of high level features. Um, what this means in practice is that we're, we're saying that the variables Z tilde and Y hat will, will be assumed to satisfy Markov and faithfulness conditions with respect to a DAG and where in y hat the output of the prediction algorithm is known to be a non ancestor of any of the low level of any of the high level features so the high level features can say can tell you the can tell the prediction algorithm what to do but the prediction doesn't change anything about the the high level features themselves so a kind of illustrative simulation which i think is uh, important for understanding how this works um, we generated, uh, or Numer generated, 5,000 two-dimensional black and white images containing several possible shapes as well as noise. So these black and white images whoops, uh, contain um, vertical bars, horizontal bars, circles, and rectangles uh, located at various places in the, in the 2D field. And as a simulation, we can label each output image with uh, a binary label, one or zero. This kind of um, is meant to, to approximate some sort of setting where some behavior is being predicted on the basis of the image, say, you know, whether it has cancer or doesn't have cancer, whether it has pneumonia or does not have pneumonia, based on something about the shapes inside the images. And because so we generated those images according to a, a kind of known uh, structural causal model or a directed acyclic graph that's depicted below where uh, in truth, we, we design it such that vertical bars and circles are the ones that are causally efficacious for the outcome label Y. Um, but the other variables are in various ways associated, just not causally relevant. So horizontal bars and vertical bars are associated um, and rectangles are, are, are more likely if you have horizontal bars in the image uh, rectangles and the output are associated through an, uh, this confounding variable, which is the presence of circles and so forth. And so the question is, can we try and disentangle what's important from this data if we train uh, a kind of standard deep convolutional neural network on the raw image pixels to predict why? Here we use the ResNet 18 uh, uh, framework in PyTorch, um, achieve relatively good accuracy, and then we try and learn the causes of the prediction of that neural network, y hat, um, even if we've excluded some important feature, for example, we exclude C. So the um, FCI algorithm then is used to estimate a PAG over this smaller set of variables, uh, horizontal bars, vertical bars, rectangles, and the prediction of the neural network itself. So if we have the uh, ground truth on the left, what our, what our FCI procedure will learn, given sufficient data, is this procedure, is this uh, PAG representation on the right, which correctly indicates that R is not a cause of, of the true label and, and or the predicted label Y hat, but rather is associated due to some unmeasured underlying uh, confounding uh, feature. But, uh, but that V vertical bars uh, is possibly a cause of the output of the prediction algorithm. It, can't, it does not orient some of these edges entirely, so it will be uncertain about some of the relationships in the end, but it sort of tells us intuitively correct, uh, like if under the assumption that our neural network really is learning correctly what's going on here, 
then it should be, our FCI procedure correctly uh, recovers the fact that some variables are clearly not causally important. They're not causal ancestors of the uh, prediction behavior and some are, or at least possibly are. So let me pause here for questions before going into the real uh, data examples. Okay, great. So there is, so Numer just answered the question in the Q&A, but there is, uh, there's two other questions in the Q&A at the moment. So the first one is from Vanessa. Um, can you elaborate what confounding in the context of an algorithm means as opposed to confounding in the context of the underlying phenomenon that the algorithm is trying to describe? Yes, great. Okay, good question. So um, in this case, we're interested in confounders for the... Uh, so not all of the... Um, high level features, which are in fact relevant to the prediction algorithm, the, pr the behavior, the outputs of the prediction algorithm are necessarily measured, right? So it might be that the internal representation of the neural network uh, looks at the size of the bird's beak and the shape of the bird's head and the color of the bird's throat, but we don't actually have the color of the bird's throat uh, directly measured in our, in our set of high level features. And so some other feature, which is maybe correlated with the color of the bird's throat, say, I don't know, you know sparrows more likely to have uh, bright colored throats. I don't think that's true, but say, say we're true that some other feature of the, some, some other features of the bird, like its size are correlated with the color of the bird's throat, then size will look like it's associated with the output of the prediction algorithm, even though that's not really what's being used in the internal representation of the neural network to make any classification decisions. So we're, we're sort of trying to, we have this kind of mental model of the neural network that internally it's, it's not looking at everything at once. It's looking at localized or perhaps non-localized spread out, uh, but lower dimensional representations of the big pixel space. And those lower dimensional representations map on to things we hope like uh, beak shape and throat color and so forth. And the idea is that we don't have access to all of those things. We don't know what they are uh, a priori. We just have access to whatever high level features uh, we can come up with. Um, and so there'll be potentially unmeasured confounding between what's actually making a difference to the, the algorithm's output prediction. All right, great. Um, so maybe then you can go on for uh, for some more minutes since, since there's quite a lot of things to cover still, so. but uh, okay. there's more questions later on. Okay. Sure, sure. So the, the, main, the, the main sort of, the last, the remaining part of this project is the empirical part where we, so it's nice to see that things make sense to us uh, using a simulated data set, but in the real data, how does this thing work out? And the idea is that, um, so, so in the first data set, we're using data from this Caltech UCSD bird classification image data set, which is uh, a large collection of photographs of birds in different settings um, with uh, 200 categories of bird labels and 312 binary attributes that were uh, associated with each image uh, or potentially associated with each image. Binary attributes like, you know, does it have a red belly or a yellow belly or, and so forth. Um, after processing things to make the problem a bit more compact, we ended up using uh, more than 3,000 images, uh, 26 ordinal attributes. So we classify, say, you know, color into four or five different categories, like, uh, and back pattern into different categories, like, is it striped? Is it solid? Is it um, checkered or whatever? and an outcome label with only nine categories instead of the 200 categories of birds. So we group together sparrows and different kinds of seagulls and different kinds of uh, birds of prey, for example, and uh, train our uh, ResNet convolutional neural network architecture on the raw bird 
uh, images. So just using the pixels X, not using any of the high dimensional features directly. And, uh, and then try and reconstruct the PAG representation of, of, of that uh, prediction algorithm using the high level features. Uh, and there's a kind of technical point here, which is that um, uh, constraint-based algorithms can be somewhat unstable to perturbations of the data. So because you're doing a sequence of many conditional independence tests, uh, conditional independence tests may uh, falsely reject the null hypothesis. Uh, at various frequencies, depending on your sample size. And so it's often, it, it's common in the applied literature to quantify, um, to sort of aggregate the, the learned graph over multiple different subsamples of the data to make sure that whatever edges you do learn are sort of stably there across subsamples. So we're going to report basically the frequency of across subsamples, how often do we get that a particular feature is a cause or possible cause of the output uh, of the prediction algorithm. And we'll call this edge stability. And for the bird classification experiment, we see that the most stably um, possibly causal features from among the, the 20 something features that we have with this bird data are things like wing shape and wing pattern and tail shape. These are picked out uh, majority of the time as being causally relevant or possibly causally relevant to the prediction outcome, where some features are picked out very rarely or almost not at all. For example, belly pattern and wing color seems to not be uh, a relevant uh, feature for predicting the outcome of the, the, bird, category, the bird category. And, and relevant here in the sense of, is it judged to be a causal ancestor or possible causal ancestor of the prediction outcome. It's a little bit hard to visualize the whole graph for this kind of big, uh, large set of variables. So here's a subgraph of it. So the, the, the graphs will basically look like uh, a PAG representation where the outcome is Y hat and the various features, uh, here I'm just picking features that are uh, directly adjacent to the outcome Y hat. Um, may be related to each other in a variety of complex ways, and they may have different kinds of arrows into Y hat. In this case, for this uh, sample on the birds data, they all uh, pretty much these, these features, wing pattern, underparts color, upper tail color, and wing shape, throat color, they're all things which impact uh, or which are judged to be causal ancestors of the output of the prediction algorithm. And we can do the same thing uh, with the X-ray data set uh, for pneumonia diagnosis, a bit different setting. But in this case, we are using this chest X-ray eight image data set. Both of these image data sets, by the way, are publicly available online. Um, this image data set is one where uh, each X-ray is associated with a binary pneumonia diagnosis label. And the interpretable features are seven uh, radiologist findings of different sorts, cardiomegaly, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, telectasis, effusion, infiltration, mass, nodule, pneumothorax, all things which might be visible on an x-ray, only some of which are probably relevant to pneumonia. So we use a sample of about 240 images with these seven binary attributes and using again the ResNet 18 architecture which in a kind of like very simple application of, of, the, of that of that uh, paradigm gets relatively good accuracy. And so we hope we ask the question about what, what is this uh, algorithm picking up on? And we see that the most stable edges, which are judged to be causal ancestors of the outcome are things like infiltration, uh, atelectasis and effusion, whereas the other ones are not. And to us, this is a good sign because these are the things which are potentially relevant to pneumonia diagnosis. Whereas these other, uh, these other um, ailments or issues are you know, bad for their own reasons, but not directly related to pneumonia uh, necessarily. Whereas you know, having fluid in your lungs is often an important part of pneumonia diagnosis. So in this case, we can show what the whole graph looks like because there's only seven features. And so we see something that looks like a PAG where you have a few things that are undirected here a few bi-directed edges, but you have mostly directed and partially directed edges into the, um, 
into the outcome y hat. And some variables are seem entirely irrelevant because they're disconnected from, from y hat according to what we learned from FCI. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so I won't have time to talk about how this compares to alternatives, but we do compare it to um, other popular explainable AI procedures in the literature like Lyme, uh, where the results kind of look like this, um, but are, in my opinion, not particularly uh, helpful in this setting. They don't really tell you, they highlight broad images of pixel space without really telling you what's important about those regions. Uh, that makes it kind of hard to generalize across images. Uh, it's kind of a similar story with SHAP. This is a procedure that's very popular based on shapely values uh, for explaining the behavior of prediction algorithms. And we see that in the, both in the birds and in the ammonia case, they highlight certain pixel areas as being important in the sense of having a large uh, shapely value, um, but without really giving much insight, at least in my opinion, uh, into what is really going on here. Like, what is it about this cloud of pixels in the bird image that is really uh, distinguishing about this, you know, morning lark or sparrow or whatever it is? Um, so I'll just conclude very briefly so that Josh has some time to talk. Um, I think that PAG learning algorithms are more generally learning algorithms that learn causal representations but allow for unmeasured latent confounding can be useful to distinguish between possible causal determinants of the output of a prediction algorithm. Um, we can impose additional background knowledge. Uh, in this case, the only background knowledge we impose is that the prediction label does not cause the features in the image. Um, so we just say that y hat is not an ancestor of the features in the image, but you can impose additional background knowledge uh, if, if you so choose. Um, we won't go into that here. How informative the analysis will be in the end, meaning how many of the edges will be directed versus only partially directed will depend uh, on, the, on the data, on the chosen variables and the strength of your background assumptions. And then finally, um, some questions that remain with this kind of work is that we rely on the availability of interpretable features, uh, which were available in our data sets that we were using here, but not necessarily available in all applications. So can they be learned automatically in some sense, or is human input at the feature selection stage really essential? Uh, what desiderata should interpretable features or high level features Z satisfy exactly? Can we use uh, you know, state-of-the-art simulation techniques to help uh, simulate realistic interventions, to help validate what we've learned, and so forth? Um, so I'll conclude there. Our paper is this archive draft at the top, and our references are below. Uh, thanks for your time and attention. Thanks, Anne. That was a great talk. Um, so maybe just like a very short question before we move on to the discussion, because uh, there's there's a lot of questions and not, not enough time. Um, so there's a question from an anonymous attendee that says, how can we know that PAG learning is what deep learning really learns. We can't, and I don't think it is. It's, the claim is not that the internal representation of the deep learning procedure really has something like the PAG underneath the hood. We know what it does roughly. Uh, the deep, the, at least the convolutional neural network has these stages where it does feature extraction uh, learns basically lower dimensional representations of the big input image, and then classifies them according to a chain of logistic regressions, basically, right? Like a fully connected neural network. So we know what's going under the hood, going on under the hood in that sense, but we don't know exactly which features it's paying attention to and which or which it's putting more weight on in some sense um, because of this relatively complex chain of, of, of uh, operations. So the PAG is, it's not that we think that underneath that the true data generating process follows a PAG or a DAG. We know it doesn't in some sense, but we think that it's a good approximation that sheds insight on, uh, on what is going on. It illuminates what's happening because it tells us kind of stylized causal qualitative facts like is this the feature is the throat color of the bird causally relevant to the output of the prediction algorithm? 
So it's, it's somewhat in the spirit of approximating a complex thing with a simpler thing, which is what Lime and a lot of other explainable AI procedures do. But we make no assumptions that what's going on is really you know, DAG-like underneath the hood. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, so let's then move on to the discussion by Joshua. So Joshua, please share your screen. All right, thank you. And um, let me also echo uh, Dan's thanks to the organizers and the audience um, and start by saying I really like this paper. I think it's really interesting. Um, I'm taking the title of one of Dan's slides here, uh, where, but I'm making part of it into the answer of a question. So uh, what is an explanation? Answer, some philosophy. Um, and and I, maybe this audience doesn't really he, need to hear this because I think if you're interested in causal inference particularly, you're probably already more on the being open to philosophy side of things, but I do hope that the paper entices uh, people to check out more of that literature because it's really interesting. And it's helpful to remind us that there are always these background considerations that we kind of tend to forget about um, when we're when we're doing methodology. Um, so uh, unlike Dan, I don't have any formal background in in, in philosophy, so I, I don't I don't really know what a dialectic is. But let's do it. Let's advance the dialectic of um, uh, Brayman's two cultures and uh, Efron and Hasty's um, computer age statistical inference narrative. Uh, the the rough idea of the history of statistical methods is that we first come up with an algorithm. So an example could just be computing the mean. And at first, we don't know how much we can trust the result of that algorithm until we then develop a method of inference for that algorithm. So this is, I'm, I'm, you know, the joke here is I'm saying that's a dialectic. I don't know if it, whatever. But um, at any rate, I think uh, the the cool thing that Efron Hasty pointed out is that we can start to leverage algorithms for inference. So that can help us catch up because the inference culture, we're kind of slower to develop things. So if we can use algorithms to give inferences, then that can help us catch up sometimes. So, you know, the bootstraps, an example, maybe here, the FCI is a, is a good example. Um, <clears throat> so I want to say, I think this is a growth area for stat statisticians to work on uh, that it seems to me like people care more about interpretability and explainability. Uh, they realize that the algorithm culture, uh, deep neural networks methods have kind of raced ahead and given us really amazing looking predictive accuracy results, but that in a lot of cases, we don't understand why it works and we don't know when it will fail. And so people clearly now are paying more attention to the idea of explainability and how do you explain a black box's predictions. So uh, <clears throat> I think one current set of work on this, you've seen cited here, uh, methods like Lime and SHAP um, in the current paper, uh, they can provide explanations, but these explanations are a little more complicated. They're a little more challenging to interpret than what we're used to doing in, you know, in our linear models, we just interpret one coefficient of a linear regression model. And that has, even that is uh, interpretation that a lot of people struggle with. You know, if you teach students, you, you understand that that's a subtle point. And especially also if you want to think causally, it's also a subtle point. How do you interpret a regression coefficient? Now we're not just talking about a regression coefficient. We're talking about things like in line, we're talking about a local uh, sparse model to approximate this black box model near one point. So the explanations themselves are getting more complex. And now I think the area that statisticians have to work on more is uh, developing methods to give inference for these more complicated types of explanations. Um, so in this paper, uh, Dan mentioned they used edge stability. So my kind of one high level question here is what kind of guarantees are there for using this edge stability type of metric to understand, you know, we've got an algorithm that gives us an explanation. It's a PAG, it tells you, there's some edges here that tell you uh, which high level features might be causes of Y hat. Um, and then you do that many times and you have this plot of edge stability as your inference for that resulting explanation. So I think this is a good example. And I think that um, we could probably form, we could probably do a lot more research in that kind of direction. Uh, let me get my soapbox out and say, this is what I think is one of the most important limitations to this area of talking about explaining black boxes. 
people need to remember that explaining the black box is not the same as explaining the underlying phenomenon the black box predicts, right? So maybe this needs to even become another one of the catchphrases like association is not causation. Uh, interpreting why hat is not the same as interpreting why. Uh, so do we need some, and often that's what we want to do, right? Often what we really care about is not just to understand why this black box can predict well, but like, it, is it because it captures some structure that reflects some real causal structure in the world as well? So I think that's going to be uh, possibly even an implicit goal a lot of the time that people want to use methods like this to explain a black box. I think a lot of times they don't want to just understand what's causing the prediction to be a certain value. They actually want to understand what's causing the outcome to be a certain value. And they might mix these two things up if they're not careful and we have to be very clear in communicating that um i'm not sure maybe this is i maybe i'm being unfair here i think this might be more dangerous if we say that our methods are causal explanations so if we tell people that we're giving a causal explanation to a black box uh, algorithm then maybe that will make some people more likely to to make this uh, confused conclusion and jump to because to me causality is about underlying real world you know, kind of like laws of nature and, and things that always have to happen. And in that sense, the natural cause of what makes a, a algorithm do what it does is that a programmer wrote code to make that algorithm do that. So that's for my causal explanation for, for any black box. Um, and just to, to kind of drive this point home, this takes us outside the context of the current paper because I'm gonna say, let's forget about the high level features for a minute. And that simplifies away the problem that this paper cares about almost completely. But suppose um, we just have X and Y, and the true causal DAG is Y causes X, right? You can think Y is an underlying health condition, X are some types of clinical covariates that might be symptoms. Now, if you train a black box algorithm to predict Y, most likely uh, the symptoms do cause the black box to predict a certain value for Y. But in reality, you know, in the real world, the, the causal direction is the other way around. Now, this could be still useful as a model diagnostic. Dan mentioned this. Um, but like I said, I think a lot of times people have a real goal of changing the world. And so in that case, you know, if, if they come up, their explanation method tells them that X causes Y hat, and they go out and they start saying, we've got to manipulate X in order to change Y, then they're in trouble. Okay, so this is just a recap um, of my high level questions uh, in case there's any time to, for, for discussion. You know, we've got a, a type of inference for this new, for this explanation approach, edge stability. Is there any work telling us what kind of guarantee that inference might have? And um, can, we, can we actually form some rough ideas? You know, things like, uh, things like no unobserved confounding where it's a sufficient condition that an explanation of the black box corresponds to an explanation of the real world. Like how do we know when a black box is capturing causal structure and so that explaining the black box is telling us about the real world as well. Uh, do the qualities of these explanation, does the quality vary if, um, if the black box is overfit or has poor out of distribution generalization, for example. The last question here I noticed some people were bringing up in the Q&A too. Um, you know, there's some assumptions in this work. And in particular, I'm wondering if any of those assumptions uh, might break down in the case where you try to learn the high level features. So, you know, you've got this kind of directionality assumptions and could those be broken if you're using the same data to learn the high level features as the black box? And I'll stop there. Great, thanks. Uh, very nice discussion. So then maybe you can take a minute or two to answer these questions, even though we're over time, um, just so that the discussion doesn't end without the discussion. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks a ton, Josh, that was great. Um, sorry that I went for so long that we don't have time to discuss very much. Let me just say very quickly a couple of things that related to what you brought up. I really agree that the, the distinction between why hat, which is the output of the algorithm and the underlying phenomenon, why is, super important, very important. And we try and emphasize that a lot in the paper. 
And so you're right that explaining why hat is not the same thing as explaining why, and it would be um, wrong and bad for people to mix this up when they interpret these kinds of results. So our interest here is the kind of causal real world that you refer to is the real world of the algorithm. So we wanna know what could we change in the image that would make the algorithm label this patient as having pneumonia rather than not having pneumonia or the reverse. Not the true pneumonia, the true why is the actual pneumonia status of this, you know, that's used in the, in the training section of the procedure, but that what we care about is understanding the behavior of this prediction algorithm and understanding that like, well, if, if the person had just had, um, you know, we see that the person has fluid in their lungs, but if they also had um, an enlarged heart, then that would have, you know, ruled out pneumonia because that's due to something else. That's sort of, that would be a good thing for the algorithm to be picking up on internally because that would mean the algorithm like knows something about the underlying disease and isn't tracking something that's ultimately irrelevant. So, so I think it is very important that when we talk about like how the explanation relates to the causal truth out there in the world, like the world that we're studying here isn't the world of pneumonia, it's the world of pneumonia predictions from a neural network. So we have to ask about like what's going on in that world. And I think we have a good understanding of the mechanism. Like I said, we know how a convolutional neural network works in a sense, we can write it down. And so we just don't know exactly what it's thinking about, you know, what it's putting weight on in some sense. And so that's the part of the world that we're trying to get some, some grasp on. Um, another point you made, uh, well, so one point you made about edge stability and guarantees. In general, there's not a lot of guarantees of this sort, but there is some related uh, work by Peter Buhlman and company where they have they show some kind of like false discovery rate guarantees for this kind of subsampling procedure that we do. So they show that basically, if you're just thinking about adjacencies and whether the adjacencies are there or not, you can, you can derive some um, probability guarantees on the, on, you know, on the probability of having a uh, unexpected false discovery rate under this kind of subsampling procedure. And so that'll tell you, you know, whether the edge frequency, uh, at least for the adjacency part is reliable in some sense, although it doesn't say very much about orientations. Um, uh, but in general, I think there's an issue because with, with, with uh, demanding guarantees in the setting, because it's not clear uh, what the true assumptions would be, right? So like any guarantee you, you prove a theorem about is gonna be based on some uh, mathematical assumptions about what the data generating process is, you know, whether things are Gaussian and whether things follow a particular uh, uh, distribution when, when they're generated. And I think here it's just that none of those assumptions are likely to hold. Like any assumption I could come up with about the data generating process and prove a theorem about is gonna be not true of the setting that we're studying here. And so it seems to be, I mean, I'm open to, you know, proofs are great and theoretical results would be interesting if we have them, but it's like, I guess I'm skeptical that we'll have any grounded in an assumption that's realistic to this kind of domain. And so that, that's why the best I sort of aim for at this stage is uh, a reasonable approximation. Like, I think it's very, very intentionally, like we're approximating at every step here. And that's because that's, I think, the best we can do in this setting. Um, and then okay, very I, I'm yeah, sorry, I, I'll stop I there. really yeah. need to cut you off. <laughs> yeah. um, right, sorry about that. So, Jihan, uh, you can finish off. I would like to thank Numer for heroically tackling many questions in the Q&A. Uh, any unanswered questions will be passed on to the speaker. So please uh, feel free to contact the speaker if you have any follow-ups. Thank you. Uh -huh. And sorry, Dan, again. Thank you. All right, so um, next week we will have uh, Wesleyan from, um, oh, this is not the correct page. Yeah, next week we will have Ted Wesleyan from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, he will talk about non-parametric tests of the causal null with non-discrete exposures. So I hope I'll see everyone next week. <laughs>